what a what a privilege, what a blessing for me to be here. Um, I know it's been it's been many years ago since um, um, Pastor Joe went to Haiti and taught us the Bible, and so last year we were we were we were in um, Cabo Chapo, um, Costa Mesa, and Pastors Conference, and he invited me to to the church, and I was so excited. He said, "Oh." As I taught you the Bible, now I want you to come and 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 let the church share the church with what I've been t- um, teaching you for for years. And I said, "Wow!" <laughs> I was a little bit um, um, a little bit really frustrated, but um, I know because of God, so we could we can do all things. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for having me. Um, I'm from Haiti, Capetian, which is the second city of Haiti. Um, I I am married. I have two daughters, and it's such a blessing um, to see what God is doing for, for my life there in Capetian, and it just, um, it, around six years ago, God called me there to open a, a, a ministry, and God just using it to reach out the community, and God has been doing so many things there by his grace, and we are so blessed to be a part of that what God is doing. And thank you so much, Pastor Joe. He's my pastor, and he's such an amazing blessing to me, and I'm so grateful to be here with you today. So um, I want to share a little bit um, from the Word of God in 2 Samuel chapter 9. This is a, a chapter that talks to my heart a lot, to my life, and I think I believe that this is uh, an illustration of my of the serve of my life as I'm going to the uh, to the scripture. So I will share with you more on on my my story and and the updates on Haiti. Um, but for now, we want to go to Second Samuel chapter nine, verse. Um, we we will see the whole the whole chapter, but I'm gonna um, skip through some verses. So um, just skip it with me, please. First, in, in 2 Samuel, this is uh, chapter 9. This is a story about King David and the, this man named Mephibosheth. Now, you, you know about Mephibosheth. He was um, one of, the, one of the, the son of Jonathan, who was the son of King Saul. Now, let's read it. He said that in verse, nine, verse 1. Now, David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, uh, Mephibosheth, he was the descendant of King Saul. He was born into a family that had been rejected by God. You remember that um, King Saul, he disobeyed to God. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, this is when God said, okay, because you, you don't obey me, and okay, I, I'm going to uh, reject you. And this family had been once in, in power. Now they were out of favor with God. And with men, and I believe this is uh, this is true for every person into born into the human family. So there was a time when humans were giving dominion over the earth. We can read it in Genesis Genesis chapter one verse twenty six. However, when men sin in the in the Garden of Eden, the entire human race um, fell from the power and from favor. Now all humans that are born into the, this world are born as members of a disgraced um, in foreign family. Um, the culture of that, that day, so when a new king um, um, come into palace, but the, the family of the, the old king is supposed to die because so that they can prevent the, the rising of the, uh, the family against the new king. So the family, the family of, of King Saul, all the family of King Saul is supposed to die, but this guy, who was named Mephibosheth, he was the only one left from King Saul. Now, um, we, we can see even in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 3 that even David, he was busy purging the sons of Saul because Mephibosheth was a descendant of Saul. He, wa, he too was doomed to die an inglorious death. The Bible, um, if, we, if we look at, keep reading it in, the verse, in verse 2, it says that, and there was a servant of the house of Saul, whose, whose name was Ziba. So then they, they had called him to David. The king said to him, are you Ziba? 
He said, at your service. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Mekir, the son of, of Emir and, and Ludiba. Now, the Bible tells us that in verse 4, that Mephibosheth was living in a place called Ludiba. And if you look at this word, it means that no pasture. So he was in the house of Mekir, so which means sold. Now, uh, we can see that Mephibosheth was living in a place of poverty and want. And consider the fact that Mephibosheth was, was a crippled man because he had been dropped by his nurse when he was five years old. And as a result of that, he was lame on both of his, of his feet. Um, oh, by the way, don't let that nurse uh, take care of your babies. So um, because he was lame, he could, he could not work. Um, he, were, he, he had inherited nothing but poverty and death from his family. He was a man who was, who was um, in a desperate situation, and he was a man who was missing the best life he had to offer, and he was a man in a terrible situation. And I consider the human family in a des who is in a um, des destitute uh, condition as, as well. He is in a position of having the pasture. He's sold under his sins. He is lost and needs a redeemer to deliver him from his slavery. We are born in sin and are doomed to hell, and there is nothing at all that we can do about it. You see, a lost sinner cannot save himself. He cannot turn over a new leaf and be better. He cannot purchase his salvation. The lost sinner is absolutely destitute before the Lord, helpless, hopeless, and completely without power. The human condition is summed up in quietly, plainly in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. I, can, I read it. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God and the world. Notice that despite all that the bad things between David and, and Saul, David wants to honor the covenant he made with Saul's son, Jonathan. David therefore reached out to Mephibosheth because of the love he had for Jonathan. This is a picture of, of what God has done for the sinner. Just like Mephibosheth, our family was doomed, disgraced, and destitute. Just like the family of Saul. There was one, but there was one who loved us so much. As amazing as it may seem, God loves the human family. He proved his love when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sin. Now, God reaches out to sinners on the basis of his love for us. You see, we cannot buy our way to God. We cannot work our way to him, just like Mephibosheth. We are lame on our feet and are helpless and hopeless before God. But because of his son, because the son of God went on the cross in our place for our sins, now we can get to call his, his children. I like that in verse 5. I want, I, want, I want you to read verse 5. It says that then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Emil from Lodiba. You can see that when David discovered where Mephibosheth could be found, he started the process of bringing Mephibosheth unto himself. He sent his servants to fetch Mephibosheth from the place of death, defeat, disgrace, and doom. I want you to know that the sole thing was not, from, was not Mephibosheth's idea. It was conceived in the heart of David. And it was carried out through the efforts of David alone. Also, 
put yourself in the place of poor old Mephibosheth. He must be, maybe, he must have been so terrified when, he, when the king's soldiers come to, the, to, the, to take him to Jerusalem. Surely, I think that I, I picture Mephibosheth in my mind hearing that the, the soldiers of David are asking for him. Maybe, maybe he was trying, man, oh man, it seems I'm done. He's David, come to get me. Maybe I'm going to die. But because he was crippled, he couldn't try to run, you know, because, you know, he, he, couldn't, he, could, he couldn't go anywhere. This is what he was thinking in his mind. Probably, man, oh, I'm going to die. Oh, I'm done, man. Oh, Lord, please help me, Lord. Maybe this is what he was thinking in, in his mind. Yeah. I think he, he feared the worst that day. However, David did not have evil plans for Mephibosheth. Only plans that were good. In fact, that day, the servants of David came to get that poor, crippled man who turned out to be the best day of his life. You see, Mephibosheth came to, to, before King David. He bowed himself. We, we can see that in verse 6. He bowed himself before him in humility. He even referred himself to as a dead dog. This man knew he deserved nothing but judgment and death. Yet when David opened his mouth to, to speak, he spoke words of peace, of grace, of encouragement to Mephibosheth. He spared him. David speaks to Mephibosheth. He does not condemn the, to him to death. Instead, he speaks to him as one of his, of his, of his, of who, one who is much loved. He promises to him that he will experience kindness, grace, restoration, and provision. David is telling him that everything has changed now. That the king has come and calling you. I think we all deserve to go to hell. We do not deserve mercy. We do not deserve grace. We do not deserve salvation. However, those are just the things that we, we receive. When we come to Jesus by faith, every hell-bound sinner who will come to the Lord be, to be saved will find his sins forgiven, his sentence stricken from the books, his future changed, and his destiny sewed up. We cast ourselves upon the mercy of God, of a God who has the power and the right to cast us into, the, into hell. Yet, when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, everything changes. We are no longer God's enemies, but we become his sons and daughters. We are no longer doomed to hell, but we have become destined for heaven. We are not sinners, but saints. Not separated, but sons. We find ourselves brought into the family of God, the Father. Thank God there's a friend in Jesus. Thank the Lord. Um, many years ago, I, I found myself growing up, growing up in a um, small family, six children, two boys, four girls, and a little small house of two rooms, um, mom and dad in, the, in one room, and all the kids are sleeping in the, in the, in the other room, girls and boys. <laughs> so, and, but... One thing we learned, it was my family, my, my, my parents, they loved the Lord. And my mom, she, was, she always tell me, Leo, you're going to be a pastor one day. You're going to be a pastor. And I was little, and I didn't, I didn't think too much about that. And she always think that. And she was like a soldier. She was the one fighting to, to make sure that we, we get some food, we go to school, we, we, get, we, we get some clothes. She was a soldier because she's going to do anything, you know, selling any things on her head, you know, to try to get some money home and so that she can take care of us. And what happened after a few, day, a few years and she's, she's, she's gone. She dies. And we were broke. We were totally broke. We didn't have nothing. And six kids. Only dad, and my dad, didn't, he's a carpenter, but there's no jobs in Haiti. And with six kids for, to, to eat, to go to school, to clothe, 
and we have nothing. Man, we were totally broken. But that was the time that I was start to pray more. I start to pray more. Go to Bible studies. We go to a um, Baptist church in that time, and um, we we're praying to the Lord. Lord, why, what do you want to do? Why? Lord, help us, Lord. We need your grace, Lord. We need your mercy. We, we, we've been praying, the, the, our family. Now, there's a, there's a time, there's a day at the church, there's someone come. And at that time, I just graduated from, from, uh, from um, high school. And there's a guy who came in the church. He said, I, I have a special announcement. And, and the church said, great. And he said, you know, um, I have a contact in port of a of a Bible school, and so I can help guys from the church to go to the school for free, and he's my contacts, so if, you, if there's some guys here who are interested, so just get my contacts, and I will help you to, to go to the school, and as I was praying, and for that, I mean, because my mom, she always told me that, and when the guy said that, oh, man. Maybe this is an opportunity. Oh, praise the Lord. And I was so excited. And after church, I go to find a guy and talk to him. He said, yeah, man, come to Port Prince. I'm going to help you to go to Bible school. It's going to be free, and it's going to be great. Oh, I was so excited. And um, I said, great. Now, I get, I, I, when I get, go back home, you know, I tell all my friends, man, I'm going to go to Port Prince. I'm going to go to a Bible school, man. And after some years, I'm going to go back here, you know, starting a church, and it's going to be great. I, I was so excited. And um, now, we didn't have the money to go, you know, to pay. Because Carpation, my hometown, which is my hometown, it's six hours away from Port Prince. Port Prince is the capital. And I collect some money. And I, 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 you know, pack my backpack and, and go to port prince Now, when I go to port prince I get to port prince I didn't have any, any people there, any family, any friends there. And I hope that I'm going to find a guy quickly and get me to the school. But I never see the guy. I'm trying to call him, man, where's this guy? I, I can't find him. I'm trying to call him on the phones and never able to find him. Man, what I'm going to do, Lord, please help me. And, man, I was there, and I didn't have a place. I didn't have a place to stay because I was so excited. I didn't, I didn't plan anything. I just I know that I'm going to fight this guy. And what happened, and I could, I could find him. After days walking in port prince in the streets of port prince and cannot find a guy, and finally I said, what to, what to do? And the Lord told me, now go back to, go back to Carpation. It's, that, it's like I, I, I went to port prince too early. And um, go back to Carpation. And I said, man, I, how am I going to go back? It's like I hear the small voice in my, in my heart, you know, go back to Carpation. And now I'm wondering how I'm going to go back to Carpation because I got to get some money to pay the, the, the fare bus. It's like $20 U.S. and I don't have it. And also, also um, not only I don't have the money, but, but you know, I came here to, you know, to go into school. And all my friends, everybody know, in my community, they know that I go to school now. It's gonna be shameful for me, you know, when I get there and no school, nothing, and, and I, that, would be, that wouldn't be good. And when I, and finally, Lord, just go back there, go back there. And, and as I felt the, the pressure in my heart to go back to Carpation, and I didn't have the, any money, what I did, I went to a, bu um, to a bus station and I said, a driver, a bus driver, um, arrived to get me to Carpation. I told him, when we get to Carpation, I mean, I'm going to um, talk to my family. They're going to pay him. He said, no, there's no way. No, no way we can't do that for you. He said that, you know, um, it's 20 bucks. Either you pay 20 bucks or you, you stay in Border Prince. I said, oh, my goodness, Lord, please help me, man. So <laughs> I, I'll give you this T-shirt. He said, no, no. <laughs> that, don't work. that don't work for it. <laughs> and he said, no, I can't do that. Man, I was, Lord, what should I do? And you know what? Um, I said, okay, man, I have no choice. What I did, I saw in the back of the bus, there's, a, there's ladders, you know, the school, the school buses. They have ladders in the back. And I said, maybe, maybe this is my ride there. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just waiting. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I don't know what to do. So um, finally, and as the bus is leaving, man, 
and I had my backpack in, 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 in my bag, and I said, man, okay, man, I, I don't know, man, I'm going to do it. And I just jumped in the back of the bus and hold the ladders. Man, I, I'm telling you, man, I, I, I did this. I was a real Spider-Man for six hours. Yeah. For six, for six hours, I hold the ladder in the woods of Haiti. I mean, not the woods here. Bumpy woods, a lot of turns, a lot of, you know, just, and uh, he's me, oh, Lord, please help me, Lord. <laughs> you know, I'm holding, oh, I'm loading, so, I'm holding this thing so fast. And sometimes when I feel, oh, man, sometimes I think that I, I'm done, I'm done there. I'm done, but the Lord kept me safe there until I get to, to Capetian. And when I, when I got there, I, I went in and, and with the driver, oh, how can you get there? I flew here, man. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that was so amazing. The Lord kept me alive because you could, you know, I could instantly die there, but the Lord kept me alive and I get to, to Capetian. But I get to Capetian on Friday on Friday afternoon, and on Tuesday, the big earthquake hit Port-au-Prince, and over 300,000 people died. Over, it was terrible. And some people knew that who knew that I was in Port-au-Prince, and they were trying to uh, find family. Is Leo still in Port-au-Prince? Man, I heard everybody died in Port-au-Prince. I heard all the house fell. How's the and, and, and man? And that was when I, I was thinking, wow. Maybe if I stayed in Portland, I didn't obey to voice, I didn't, you know, try this, maybe I would die there. Because so many people died. It was terrible. And I said, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, for getting me out of Portland. That was your plan, Lord, that was your grace, your mercy for me. And now I'm, I, I stand in Portland. I stand in Carpation, but Portland totally messed up, and it's terrible. Now, um, they are trying to clean um, port au and and um, having tent cities all over. And people are living in tent cities, extreme poverty. People are fighting all kinds of terrible things in port au right now. It's totally messed up. And in fact, I never hear about the guy. He never comes back to church. We never hear from him till now. We don't know what happened to him. So, um, but I think um, maybe some weeks uh, being in, in Capetian, and it's like the Lord told me now, go back to port au oh, Me, Lord? And port au now is totally messed up. It's, it's really bad. People are living in tent cities. And it's, you know, it's crazy there. And it's like the Lord said, now it's time to go. Oh, my goodness. How am I going to go back there? And the Lord said, no, it's time to go. And finally, I try, okay, Lord, I'm going, Lord, I'm going. And finally, I try, you know, back, you know, get a little bit, a bit of, you know, some little clothes. I know there's no clothes there, you know. I'm trying to get a little gallon of water because I know there's no water there. There's no food, nothing. And I try, you know, get anything I can get from Capetian, and I go to Port-au-Prince. And I wake, when I get there, um, there's, I met a guy, and he said, I said, man, I, I'm from Capetian, man. I come here, man. I, I just need a place to stay. I'm praying, man, the Lord has me here. He, want, he has something in plan, and I, I, I want to be here. He said, really? Okay, no problem, man. I have a nice place for you. I said, really? He said, yeah, you're going to have your own room, your own bathroom. And, and I said, really? Are you serious? He said, yeah, I'm coming, man. And that guy, what happened? The guy took me to a huge tent city, and he showed me that tent. He said, he's your room, man. You can stay as long as you want. I said, really? And... He, we we were like, we went to um, to the tent city. It's like it was like um, maybe um, around two three two two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And when I got inside there, that was so hot. I could stay for five minutes. I said, man, I, I cannot stay inside there, man. He said, man, everybody does that. You can do it too. I said, man, I can do it. And he said, yeah, you can. And finally, what we did, man, during the during the night, we can we can stay inside there. But during the day, we can't because it's too hot. It's plastic. And, man, but I was there. I saw people, they were fighting. They were, you know, all kinds of problems. But I was praying to the Lord, Lord, man, please help us, Lord. 
you, you, need, you need your grace. We need your mercy. I was praying all the time while, while I was there. And there was a guy I knew from Capetian. And one day I saw him come to, to the tent city. He said, oh, Leo, are you here? I said, yeah, man, I'm here, man. He said, um, whoa, what are you doing here? I said, man, I'm here, man. I'm praying. I, I don't know, man. I'm still waiting on the Lord. He said, really? He said, um, hey, why don't, why don't you come to me to find me in that church tomorrow? And I'm going to help you to find a little job. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. I said, really? Are you serious? I was so excited. And he said, great. Um, and, but the church, the, the church he told me to go to, it's a Pentecostal church. And it's very far. It's like over two hours walking from where I stayed to the church. But I, you know, wake up very early and go to that church. I was so excited. And when I get to that church, and, you know, Pentecostal church, they last, you know, hours and hours. You know, starting 7 in the morning. And it, it's it almost 1 o'clock, and the pastor is not yet finished to preach. Oh, my goodness, Lord. And and I, I, the whole time, I... I'm, I'm sitting there, where's the guy? He never showed up. Never. I'm, oh, my goodness, maybe he's stuck in traffic. Let me stay a couple more minutes. Uh, where's the guy? Never showed up. And finally, man, uh, you know, they, the pastor finished to preach for two hours. And, and, and after he, he final benediction and all these things, and still the guy never come. And finally, they, they, they asked all the people to, to go, to leave. And I, I told the washers, man, I'm... I'm I'm praying a little bit. Wait, wait on me. Because I'm predicting that the guy may be stuck in traffic and he will come. And I told the guy, the usher, he said, can you, hey, sir, can you leave right now? Because we're going to close the doors. I said, wait a minute, man. I'm praying to the Lord, man. I wanna, <laughs> I'm talking to God. <laughs> and because I, th- I think that the guy may be in his, in, in, a way, in his way coming. But finally, he never come. And I said, man, what am I going to do? And I said, okay, I'm going to. Maybe I'm going to walk back. And I'm going to walk back. It's over for two hours again to go back to, this, to the, that third city. And it's like when I'm walking now, I hear the voice of God. He said, go to the mission house. Go to that mission house. Now, I heard about the mission house, but I never um, go to that place before. And I said, whoa, mission house, mission house. And I said, okay, great. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going there, you know. I'm walking, I'm singing, oh, look great to the Lord. And when I got to that mission house, and it was, you know, there was fence around it, and I just sit, sit outside of it and just reading my Bible, man. I was reading the whole book of John, man, chapter one, chapter two. And I was reading the Bible, and as I'm reading the word, and there was a guy who walked up to me. He said, hey, man, what are you doing here? I said, I'm reading the Bible. What's wrong with that? <laughs> he said, are you a believer? I said, yes, I'm a believer. He said, um, um, why, why are you here? He said, um, I'm here, man, because um, I was hoping I could go to a school because um, uh, the Lord told me to come here and uh, because um, I can go to a Bible school because I wanted to be a pastor and my, before my mom died and she wanted me to be a pastor and now I don't have any means to go there. You know, I'm just here and waiting on him and praying and, and, and still see what he wants to do. And the guy said, really? Are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious, man. And he said, okay, man, um, let me see. He said, you know what? Um, the, Lord, the Lord sent me here to open a Bible college, and it's going to be a free Bible college. All the students are going to live there, and they're going to, they're gonna um, get school schooling there, and after they're gonna after graduation, they're gonna go anywhere they got called them, and to open a, a church. He said, and I choose you to be my first student. And that was the Lord. The Lord made it. <laughs> the Lord made it. And this guy was uh, a pastor from Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, Pastor Brian, and the Lord sent him to Haiti to open a Bible college. And what is great about that, he told me, while he was, the Lord told him to go to Haiti to do that, and was praying to, for the Lord to give him a confirmation that that's, he wants him to do that. And he was praying for the Lord to send him a st- student so that he can share that this is what the Lord wants. And me, I was praying for a school. And 
the Lord f made this guy flew from California to Haiti to Port-au-Prince and me from Cap Haitian to Port-au-Prince in that perfect time and to meet like this. I said, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's only you could do things like that. It's only you, Lord. And that was so amazing. And he went to a house and we, you know, called the teachers. And this is when Pastor, Pastor Joe come and teach us the Bible. And it was so great, so fun. It was good. We learning so much and from the word of God. And we all were so much excited. And after graduation, and now the Lord said, okay, I was there. And I, I was used to be to translate for the for the other students because the other guys didn't speak English. And um but because I was there, I thought that maybe I'm going to stay here, man. Keep translating for the guys, for the, the other new students. And, and it's great here, man. We have shelter. We have food. We have clothes. We have everything here. Well, praise the Lord. I was so excited I'm here. But um, the Lord said, now you, it's time to go back to your hometown. Lord, me? No, Lord. <laughs> I'm great here. I'm, <laughs> oh, Lord, praise the Lord. You put me here, man. I have food here. I don't want to go. And it, the Lord said, no, it's time for you to go to garbage. And man, I said, oh, Lord, going to garbage, and man. <laughs> and yeah, it's, and the Lord kept telling me, go back to garbage. And finally, I said, man, what am I going to do? I have to obey. And I told, I, I go to Pastor Brian, and I said, man, the Lord told me to go to garbage. And it said, I'm leaving, man, I'm leaving. He said, really, are you leaving? I thought you were going to stay here to transit for the other student. I said, man, this is what I wanted, but I can't do it. The Lord wanted me to go back. He said, well, okay, you know, just go and, you know, do what the Lord wants you to do. And finally, I take my backpack, you know, little things that I have, and I moved back, went back to my hometown, to Carpatian. And when I, get, when I get there, just, I, I saw some of the kids in the streets. I evangelized them. Oh, they were so excited, and I invited to, to the house where I stayed, and they, they come, and it was eight kids, and after next week, they 20 kids, after next week, 30 kids, 50 kids, 100 kids, they keep going up. I said, whoa, that's a ministry right here, and um, I, I, I called Pastor Brian, hey, man, I have, I, I have a, an amazing children ministry, <laughs> guess what, man, they keep going up, I keep coming back to Puerto Prince, man, I'm staying here. And it's good. And now after I got young people like me start to coming, and it's going great. And finally, okay, the Lord said, okay, now it's the time to open the church. And I, I invite people. I said, okay, we're going to start a Bible study. We're going to start from, from the book of Matthew. Matthew. And after we're going to go to Mark, Luke, and we're going to go through the whole Bible. And, and the people start to come into the Bible study. Oh, that's great, man. And let's go to another book. Let's do another book, book after book. And people say, oh, great. Okay, now let's do the church. And finally, we opened the church. We opened the church. But we started with just a children's ministry. And now it's a, it's a full church, around 300, people, 300 adults. And we have so many kids. And, and, the, and, and the Lord using the ministry... We have, a, we have a feeding program for kids because it's a really poor community where people are very starving. And we have around 70, 70 to, um, to 80 kids that we feed almost every day. And we're just um, opening a school to, to put those kids because so many of them, they don't go to school because parents cannot afford it to send them to school. Um, because schools are, um, there's not a lot of public schools. And the private ones, they are very expensive. And the people, they don't have job. The unemployment there is over 70%. It's terrible. And even right now, it's, it's even more crazy because of all violences going on. For um, several months, for several months, the country, they, they call that um, lockout. L they lock the country. So anywhere you are, when they, when they lock it, you cannot move. You have to stay wherever you are. Because they, you know, the government people, they, they were supposed to do certain, certain things in the country, and they don't do anything. And because of that, the people, they are so mad, and they are doing riots against the, against the government, against the president. And almost every day, there's people getting shot. You know, people are dying. All, all kinds of bad things are happening there. So, but, but by the grace of God, the Lord used the church. Um, we not only um, having the church, and also having the children ministry and doing all this work with the kids, 
but we have, a, like we have different programs in the church working with women. We have a, pro a project that we call Tabita Project. Tabita Project, it's a project where we train women how to do small business and we give them some money so that they can go and do, uh, you know, do little business and they can provide for their families because we, in the church and in the community, we have so many single women with six, seven kids and they don't have, you know, they have no ways to provide for themselves if an, in, in, for the family. So the Lord has been using the ministry so much in the community to reach out. I remember um, to over two years ago, there was a guy, two guys in the community, they were voodoo priests because that's, that's a culture which is very influenced by the voodoo. By voodoo. And there was two guys up there, they were threatening my life. They said, I'm gonna kill you, man, because there was people um, who, who have been um, in my, you know, voodoo things, and now they don't come anymore. They go to your church, man. I, 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 we're going to kill you. I say, really? Thank you so much, man. <laughs> I'm going to go straight to heaven, man. He said, oh, I'm not kidding with you, man. I'm going to kill you. I said, okay, man. But I want to tell you, the Lord loves you, man. He, he has the best, the best plan for you. He wants you, he wants you to know him because He's plan for you is a plan of good, not evil, to give you future and hope and all these things. He was, he was mad. He was crazy. And after a certain day, we keep, I keep talking to them. And both of them, and what happened? Guess what? Both of them accepted the Lord and the church. And one of them, his whole family accepted the Lord. And right now, one of his son is like my assistant pastor. I raised them up. <laughs> I raised them up. I have a discipleship group every Saturday we meet, and now he's my assistant pastor. You know, but that was the guy, and one of them uh, just went with the Lord, and one of them is still in the church serving, and his son is my assistant. So the Lord made that, and today I'm just looking at. Um, I see what the Lord is doing. I said, "Whoa, Lord, that's that's your grace, Lord. That's your love." Because there's no way that could happen with me. You know, people look at me. They said, oh, Leo, man, you're doing great. I said, no, man, not, not, it's not me, man. I'm just a, a gumshoe, man. You know, it's totally the Lord. It's totally the Lord. Because, and what is great about that, it's um, the community where the ministry is, this is where I grew up. Everybody knows me there. And they know my family. They know where I, where I was. They know I was hopeless, helpless. I, you know, I didn't have any hope in the life, but the Lord had a plan. The Lord, you know, this is what his grace does. Take us from the, from the ashes, from the downhill, and using us for his glory. And this is amazing. And this is why when, I look, when I'm looking at this chapter and seeing Mephibosheth was once living in that place in extreme poverty, and now... He, you know, he came to, he met with the king. And from that day forward, every, all, all of his needs going to meet out of the resources of David, of the king. And he's going to treat as a son of David. And this is what the Lord does for me personally. And I'm, I got, man, Lord, how could you do that for me, Lord? How could you do that? Today you're using me. And I know it's just a start. And you're, doing, you're going to do more things, more and more and more every day. Lord, you are amazing. I think this is what the Lord can do for anyone who just surrender his life to him. Just believe him. Just trust him. And he can take us from any situation we are in, from any bad situation. No matter how bad it looks, but God can, you know, take us from that and do, you know, something beautiful and use us mightily for his glory.